Uh, I want to remind folks, and I told you all wrong last week because I'm usually just clicking on the mute unmute button, but if you hold down your space bar, you will unmute yourself, and when you lift off of it, it will mute back. It's just easier tool to use um, if you want to speak. Uh, today is uh, not so formal. Um, folks just getting on, on the line are um, distinguished guests, the uh, members of the Perth Fire uh, Perth Police Department have uh, uh, well, the person who's going to do the presentation, the lead the presentation, was called in to uh, the night shift. Um, happens when you're a police officer. So he said, "Well, I can maybe try to do this," and I said, "Don't worry about it. Um, I don't want you to have to try to worry about getting on, you know, going in and having to be on a call and then having to try to do this too." So he's rescheduled for the 11th of June. So we look forward to hearing them again. And I hope Bill uh, can join us if you're available, sir, for that one. Um, and, and anybody else who uh, has a tie or interest to Australia and the um, incoming um, team from Perth. Uh, so today we're gonna, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about membership going into next year, just some high level stuff that I've learned over the last couple of weeks that I want to share and uh, we can have a short conversation and then I'm going to let um, uh, David Fishman talk about his experience, uh, his recent experience in Australia and then hear from Bill who spent um, numerous weeks with our team over in, in Australia in Perth and other locations and then also as a host to them the last time they came. So give us a little taste of what we're in store for um, going into uh, the spring of this year, hopefully, fingers crossed um, with that. And uh, if you have a question or comment, just interrupt. This is informal. Um, I, you know, if you want me to shut up, just interrupt. Tell me to shut up, whatever needs to happen. Uh, so a few things, I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, this is very high level at this point, but I uh, just want to talk a few minutes about membership, especially since we got the uh, DG online today. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes, thumbs up. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of putting together a membership plan for next year. Uh, and so this has not been approved yet by the incoming governor or seen, but I just wanted to sort of talk at a high level of what we're going to focus on. And as you can see, this is a, a matrix here. And um, I mean, look, guys, right now, uh, we're about plus 18 in membership for the year. And we haven't hit the June 30 mark yet. Right. And so I don't need you know, it's sort of up in the air. We don't know what membership is going to look like going in the year. If we're going to be up or down. Um, I think it's going to be either way. It's, we're going to be down. It could be down to a few people or up a few people. Um, but we need to figure out how to grow Rotary in our district. We're doing a bad job and not just us. There's many districts throughout North America that are facing the same thing. Um, and we had some really, I, I spent a lot of time going into my year with the first membership chair we had, um, and also with, um, Jim Holcomb, who had some really great ideas about how to exp expand our membership through Interact, interact, and some other things. Those are um, Harry's ideas. Huh? You're on mute. I don't know. He's 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 refuting my what I'm saying. Um, but uh, we're going to carry those ideas over into this year. And then also, I've been working with Earl, who's our current membership chair. Um, he's he's done some great things around the data, but also around um, as we begin to generate and talk about how we're going to um, expand our district team. On membership but it really comes down to, in my mind to four things the first is club expansion and that means how do we get clubs to be a little more nimble during this time um, things like what we're seeing um, maybe alternate meeting times and locations so we're getting a, a greater portion of our communities the opportunity to be involved um, one thing that Jim talked about a lot going in he's gonna talk about it, he's uh, he sees into the future. He, he's talking about this going into my year is passions, right? So one of the things that uh, I was on a call with Chris Jones, who's the 
um, international level. And Chris was talking about RAGs, which are Rotary Action Groups. And one he happens to be involved with is uh, motorcycling. And so they uh, have a club that basically, you know, uh, there's a club that meets uh, basically as motorcyclers and he's a um, honorary member. So if he, and I forgot where this club is located, but if he goes there, you know, he gets to make up by riding a, a motorcycle and it's kind of neat, right? It's his passion. Um, let me tell you, if there was a club in our area that met on, you know, anything from photography, I would love to have a, to have a group of Rotarians go out and do photography uh, opportunities with, or bicycling, or, you know, I'm actually a member of an action group, international action group on whiskey um, and bourbon. Uh, you know, better yet, let's have a club that does all three, you know, maybe not simultaneously, but uh, the point is you're gonna get people who maybe are not necessarily informed about all about Rotary at the beginning, but have a passion they wanna share. And then uh, through that, will become great Rotarians. Uh, many people wanna provide community service. That's their passion. Right, my club, that's, everybody in my club is really, really big on community service. That's what we do. Um, that's the tie that binds us together. Uh, you know, we've got to figure out what people are passionate about and make that happen within our Rotary Clubs. And again, Jim has talked about this on numerous occasions. Jonathan? Yeah. Are Rotary Action Groups and Rotary Fellowships different? Yes. I mean, Rotary Action Groups are just essentially um informal ways for folks to get together on by topic so if you're interested in that you can meet other rotarians think of it like a meetup group I think you um, got that backwards governor the the action groups are, are chartered to actually do things like the water uh wash rag the washing the water action right. group and uh, the peace uh action group fellowships are the informal organizations that that bring people of similar interests together and we have many many fellowships available I'm sorry, you're right. I had it backwards in my head. Um, yeah, so RAGs are specific um, groups on specific actionable items uh, related to Rotary's mission. But you know, both are both can serve the same thing, right? Getting people involved based on a passion, and that's generally what I'm trying to talk about here. Uh, you know, thinking about different formats of meetings, as I said before developing satellite clubs, all those things that we've seen this year, the clubs that have grown have embraced those things. Um, and as I was saying on a call the other day, basically if you look in our district and the clubs that have grown, it's either they focused on diversity and inclusion, they focused on um, their meeting formats and creating satellite clubs, or they focus on things like types of membership, like corporate memberships. And those, those three, have really, if you look at the clubs that have grown, they've embraced one of those, one or more of those things. So that's one sort of the area of focus. The other is, uh, uh, again, diversity and inclusion. How are we getting more young people in? How are we um, talking with colleges and universities? One of the things uh, we're working with, hopefully with Fairfax Rotary Club, um, is to start some sort of club uh, in conjunction with, um, George Mason University. It may not, it's probably not gonna be on George Mason campus, but it's gonna involve students, young professionals at George Mason, right? Uh, we're gonna talk about how to include people, you know, in my club, and again, I, I say this a lot, but my, one of my board members is somebody with um, a disability who probably thought because they have a speech impairment, maybe Rotary I'm, is not for them at the beginning. And she's actually one of our best members. And she's definitely not, you know, she's not disabled, she's able, and she's doing amazing things. But I don't see too many people like her in Rotary. And I think because they don't feel like uh, they would be invited. So how do we work on that? The third thing is re increased retention. This is the biggest problem Rotary has right now, especially in the United States. So how do we increase retention? It comes down to engagement. Engaging those new members straight away providing them leadership opportunities and personal growth. And if we do those things, uh, we can um, you know, keep people in the, in the club. I mean, we're, we're like this, we're like a bell curve. We get people in, people go out, people go in, go out. We're, you know, we gotta, we gotta 
plugged a hole in the in the boat here somehow. And we've got to do that by people having the best experience they possibly can. Um, I was on the phone last, maybe it was a week and a half ago now, with somebody who's a prospective Rotarian who had a really bad experience um, in the process of joining a club and decided not to. They want to be a Rotarian, but they didn't want to have that experience that they had. So how do we make sure we don't do that? And then lastly, increase visibility, all right? So sharing our outcomes of our projects. One of the things I'm working with Patrick to Governor Travis White on is a district-wide project, you know, and maybe in a week or so that we'll talk more about this, but uh, this is something, if we do it, we want to have a lot of publicity around it. We want people to know that our clubs and District 76 to 10 have done this great thing. And that's going to get people excited about what Rotary, what Rotary is doing in our areas. You've got to use social media more and more frequently. Dave Rowski, who's on the call, has done a great job for the district. We need to take some of his tools and what he's doing for the district and, and get the clubs to do it. Um, it's all about the power of branding as well. All right, we got to be able to have a brand that resonates, it's clear. Um, and I think we do have that, but we need to put that brand out there. And everything we do, you know, our brand is our messaging. And so um, anyway, we'll be talking more about that in the, in the days and weeks to come. And, and you've seen the center of my chart is data. It all, everything, you know, that's huge. If we don't have good data, we don't uh, know what's going on, we're not gonna be able to do well. And so. One thing under my leadership that we did fairly bad was um, there's RI referrals. Um, we tried a system that didn't work and now we've got uh, Earl, uh, who's done a great job. Uh, he and I the other day were on online looking. We have almost 700 leads over the last couple of years, most of which weren't contacted or if they were, clubs were not putting the information into RI. I know it's a pain in the ass, but we don't know they've been contacted. We don't know whether or not we've had a chance to bring them into the fold. That's really bad, really bad data. So we're working on a plan, a stronger plan going into Harry's year that will resolve this and also go back to some of these more recent folks and make sure they're contacted, the data's in the system, and we know that we've given them a chance. Um, unfortunately, about 40% or more of the folks who were referred through RI did not indicate a general geographic area. So it makes it kind of hard. So we got to come up with a, situ a plan to how we're going to contact those folks, who, who gets that responsibility. And so things we're working on. The other data is I've been trying so hard this year to get it out of clubs and it just didn't do it. People, clubs were not giving me the data is on your projects. What impact are you having in your communities? We can't support our brand if we don't know what's going on and nobody's telling us what's going on. So it's imperative this year, I'm going to try one more time in vain, to get clubs to respond on a quarterly basis to give data about their work. I've never seen an organization be successful that hasn't done this. And why our clubs refuse to do it is beyond my comprehension, but we've got to get past that. Um, we want to tell our story. Um, so I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to drop that from now. Uh, that's uh, for my thoughts going into the year. I'd love to hear what anybody else has to say, any thoughts they may have. Um, I'll show one more thing if I can find it real quick. I have it up. Then we can move on. We can see this. I lost the faces. Anyway, this was on one of the calls that I was on the Zoom meeting that I was on, and it talks about secrets of success when it comes to having um, a membership drive. And I sort of, I like some of the aspects they talk about here. One is clubs need to have a committee, a dedicated committee. It's not um, a short-term committee. This is a long-term, a full year committee. They focus on having very strong membership events. No, Jonathan, excuse me, you're, uh, we, we're not seeing what you're seeing. Sorry. Can you see it now? No, no we still have your original chart. 
All right, let me stop and try again here. Is that better? Yep, you got it. Perfect. All right. All right. Um, so this is not the end all be all, but it, it gives you some, and people want to do a uh, print screen on this real quick, you should. And I'll send this out as well, but this is just some very basic ideas on how to run a, a good event. Um, now that we're in the COVID situation, there's nothing wrong with having a online membership event. This is actually a great opportunity because people are at home. They may be curious about Rotary and it's a good way to get people together with minimal, minimal effort. They don't have to drive anywhere. They don't, um, you know, you can do it in a smaller chunk of time but people can be a captive audience. So consider that. This person recommended you have two to four of these events a year. So you're not just doing it once and, and uh, having 10 folks come and hopefully somebody uh, out of that, that's, that's one in 10, you know, joins, you know, you're constantly trying to do this. And you really focus, this is not a social necessarily. This isn't, you come together and, you know, have some hors d'oeuvres, have drinks. You know, we've all tried that. This is a lot a more focused, right? You're, you're focusing, it's, it's warm calls. You're getting four to 12 prospects. You're understanding those prospects, right? It's, it's, look, I can't sell a service or a product if I don't know who I'm selling it to. So the point is, you know something about these folks. You know what they're looking for, and you spend time during these events addressing that and giving, helping them understand what your value proposition is to them, right? Why is it, should they come and be a part of your organization? Not because you need people, but because you can help them with something. So this is just, uh, you know, some ideas. And one of the bullets down there before I quit is, it's, it's all in caps. It is not a crime to promote business networking, right? So this is a great opportunity to help people understand how they can tie Rotary into their work and how it's beneficial. Um, to think about all these things. This is sort of critical thinking moving forward. Um, open it up for a couple minutes. People have any ideas, suggestions? Well, Jonathan, I have a question. Your uh, comments, uh, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, are you expressing a need for better communications from the club up to the district level? For the data, yes. Um, because three separate times this year, I've sent out requests to get information from clubs. And the last time, I got 12 clubs responding. And that was the most. 12 out of 55, 56, wherever we're at at this point. Uh, I don't know what else to do besides send an email, um, have... Uh, you know, we had somebody from uh, one of the clubs sent out, set up a very simple 10 minute, eight minute uh, survey monkey to complete online. I couldn't have made it any more simple. Okay, um, well, uh, I'm, I'm not a uh, officer, I'm not a director of my uh, club, but I just know that I think my club is fairly a vibrant uh, group, but we've got members coming in, we've got members going out um, uh, because of a change of location. But from a member standpoint, what I'm seeing at the club level, there is very little concern or apparent interest as to what is going on at the district level. And it's probably because we are so focused on what our club is doing and it just drops off the radar. I'm wondering whether using assistant governors who come to the club meetings, whether they are virtual or, or, or uh, real, is a tool that is not being effectively used. Good question. And I think it depends. I mean, we've got uh, somebody on, the, on, on here that's uh, incoming governor, but she's also a super effective uh, area governor, and that's Pat Borowski. But she's very organized and she's very, you know, and she has a system. And I think uh, very few AGs do it at the level at which she does it. So there are, many of them are not very effective. And it's, it's not a criticism, meaning I don't think they're good people or smart and capable, but it's anything else. If you've got five or six clubs that you've got to re 
get reports from and report to. Uh, you've got to do it in a way that's very systematic, that, that integrates with the, the club schedules and, and um, you have good, in most important parts, you have strong relationships with those uh, club presidents and club members. It's key. Uh, Pat, get your hand up. Push down your space bar, Pat. Go. Okay. Um, uh, one of the things that I do share with the clubs when we're asking for data and asking for, you know, some small summary of their projects is that Jonathan, uh, Harry, who's coming up next, myself, a big part of our job <laughs> as your district governors is not just to talk with clubs and to clubs. It is to be able to talk to the outside world about our clubs, about Rotary, about the collective impact that the clubs in this district make. And if clubs are, are, are not sharing that, if we don't know what that is, we can't tell anybody anything. And let me give you just one quick example. Uh, during Glenn's year, our district was recognized by the um, Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. And we reckon for the collective efforts of our clubs that that organization kept track of, none of the clubs told the district about it, to the tune of $70,000 plus many, many times more volunteer hours. Do you know how impressive a public image story that is? So that is how it is important to the individual clubs from my perspective. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to share something. Um, so I'm president of the club at Great Falls this year and um, Pat uh, knows that belatedly I um, have been trying to load in our Rotary Showcase. Um, it was an exercise that I hadn't had experience with and so I was very busy with other club things and I let it drift and I finally said I have to get this together. So I've worked very hard to do that and it occurred to me, uh, two things occurred to me. One was that in the process of trying to completely record what's going on through the showcase and then later in award applications if one is doing that. Um, there are a number of steps. I went ahead and actually made a list of all of the steps and information that are needed to put these things together. I'm going to share it with all of the people running events in my club so that we will be able to capture the input just as it's happening. And then I'm going to task someone in our club to be responsible for doing the entries into the Rotary District uh, thing. Which brings me to my second point, and that is, I agree with someone who just made the comment that our clubs don't seem to necessarily be connected deeply with the district. And I think that um, one way that we might encourage that participation is, um, in this year as president of the club, I have under I've come to understand a lot more about the district. Um, I will be a good resource as a immediate past president to be a kind of conduit to uh, Rotary District and, and my club. And I think that's a good role for an immediate past president. Thank you, Eileen. I, I, I agree and I appreciate that. And you know, your club under your leadership has done some amazing things this year. And, you know, again, I, I want to say this isn't me this is a phenomenon that happens across membership organizations. This isn't just a rotary thing. Clubs are focused locally. They're putting their heads down. They're doing great work. <clears throat> um, you know, they don't, you know, nobody wants to report. That's not a fun thing to do. It's a time consuming thing. You know, they're looking at what they need to do to be successful as a club. However, our value add to you is we get that data. If I hadn't gotten that data, I could have turned it over to Dave <coughs> Borowski. He could have great, created some great infographics. He, we could have put some stories together given that back to the clubs and you could have shared that, um, you know, five million different ways and it would have been very impactful. And so it's just a phenomenon we've got to work through and it takes uh, effort from both the district side and from the club side to, you know, maybe we just need to make sure we have one connection that we're constantly talking to so at least one person in each club. Um, and maybe it's a better way to do that. Um, and I, I think Barry had his hand up. I want to say. I did. 
I would be remiss if we have some other AGs are doing a great job who are on here. We got people like Bob and Earl and Mary. Um, you know, there's no coincidence they're on this call because there are people who are active and they've all done a good job of communicating with their clubs in their respective areas. Uh, but we were talking about four out of 12 AGs that, you know, I can tip my hat to. So, um, Barry? Um, Fairfax Club and I'm membership chairman. And uh, we've added a few members, like 23 this year. And two, we've become extremely diverse. We have people from all over the world and a lot younger people. But the one thing I do, guys, is I try and call at least three to four members a week. Call them, not just email, but give them a phone call to find out how they're doing, where they are, et cetera. And it's amazing. People will say, you know, I'm, my family's ill, my business is changing, this is happening. They want some connection. If your older members don't call the younger members and the younger members don't call the older members, nothing is going to continue. And we're going to be on this bell curve. It's going to be the biggest roller coaster that you've ever seen in your whole life. And if you don't do this, then you're just wasting your time and your money. So try making a few phone calls. That might help you a heck of a lot. That's all. Thank you, Barry. All right, uh, Harry? Yeah, uh, two things. One, uh, uh, Eileen, uh, I'm gonna be contacting you later on today. We are more than happy at the district to take, um, uh, to utilize your abilities on uh, the district uh, um, uh, office positions and we would be uh, thrilled to have you be a part of it. So I will be contacting you later on today uh, to find out what it is you might be interested in being involved in. I would suggest to anyone that is a past president that is on this call that is interested in be being more involved at the district level to reach out to me, uh, to Don Wellen, Rich Story, uh, to Ronnie or to Jonathan uh, or to Pat or to Sheila and let us know. You know, we're not mind readers. We need to know if you have an interest in this area and we need to, we need to hear from you if that's something you are interested in doing and what you're involved in. I wanna speak real quickly to a point that uh, Jonathan made though, and that was on the issue of retention. Um, one way that we can truly grow in Rotary, and I, I always, I hear this all the time from Rotary International Directors is, uh, we set a number, or we set a record for new members that joined over the last five years. And they always give that, that figure. And they said, we also set a record for the number of members that, lo that we lost over the last five years. Um, there are some places that we're just not gonna be able to, to solve that problem. And that's something that, you know, it's just gonna be a matter of fact, you know, people die, people move, people, uh, you know, change jobs and relocate. These, these things happen. But one thing that always drives me nuts is I hear two phrases consistently. I'm interested in a quality member, not quantity member that exists. That's, that is a mistake in understanding of the individual members that we have in Rotary. Every member that is a, is a member of a Rotary Club is a Rotarian. Every member that is a member of a Rotary Club is a quality member. We may not be utilizing that member in the way that we should be, but we need to reach out to those individuals and find out what it is their passions are, what it is that um, made them join Rotary in the first place, and not simply say, well, we haven't seen them in a meeting in X number of months, or we haven't, um, uh, they don't come out and do service projects with us. They may not be interested in the service projects that you're doing. Reach out to them, find out what it is that is their passion, and ask them to put together something that would be able to be involved in that. When you reach out and find out what they're interested in, and you're able to incorporate what they're involved in into your club, you're gonna keep that person as a member, and our retention rates are gonna soar. And that's how you grow within Rotary and how uh, we do things. During a crisis like this, it is critical to have the right mindset. And the right mindset going into this is every member is essential to our club. And that every single member 
is important to our clubs, no one is expendable. And that's something that we need to, uh, we need to take back to our clubs as we start to go into the June uh, timeframe. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Good to know I'm not gonna be fired. Okay, Sheila, hand your hand up. I wanna go back to one issue you talked about, and that is the Rotary Leagues, the Rotary International Leagues. And Earl and I talked last week for a long time on this. During this break, I have really become a backroom DAC DB uh, fan expert, what do you want to call it? And I have really been working with that system. And I talked to Earl about the, I didn't know that all of the RLI, all the RRI leads from my rotary could be imported into DAC DB. And Earl and I walked through it on the phone and he showed me where they all were. But when they come in from my rotary, none of the location stuff comes. It's bare data in there. So I've been talking to the DACTB team on that. But when I went to the Fairfax Club during my uh, district conference meetings and Barry and I sat and talked, he, that club is phenomenal. And one of the main resources that Barry used was the the leads that they got and that was phenomenal and that's when i started really looking into this and i've talked to several clubs including my own they all sit around and wait for the email to come in nobody knows that there's a list in myrotary.org and now earl and i are working on when you bring it into deck to be how can you utilize it better to get these out faster and stuff so that's something that we're aware of, but that is, I really want to expand on it. I want to be the next Fairfax club and next year when Yasmin's president and bring in 23 people. And we put a membership team together instead of one person. And the woman who is leading it is the woman who was taking the emails for the leads. She said, there's got to be more to this. And that's why she volunteered to be the membership chair. She and I have talked every day for the last three weeks. So I just wanted to share that with you, that that's kind of what we're working on in the background. Thank you. Thank you. I have a um, question. Does anybody have a technology committee within their club? We do now. We just put it together this week. I have Sue Clem, who's on the phone right now. She's our technology committee. <laughs> it would be interesting, I think, um, for a member of several clubs to get together for an occasional chat on do you know that DAC TV can do this or I can find this on my rotary or something that expands That's my passion. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> I knew um, I liked you. <laughs> we'll go James and then Earl and then we're gonna switch uh topics. Go ahead, James. Jim. Yeah, mine mine's very simple. I'm gonna be doing youth next year uh, for Harry and uh one of the things we did about five years ago is we, we Try to break down the barrier you were talking about how uh, important it is to get our message out. We broke the barrier down between membership and PI. I think one of the things we can uh, take advantage of and then leverage next year is we've been talking about having youth for years. Talking about youth uh, is not a strategy. That's hope. So uh, what you can do is you can, all these uh, youth activities and youth exchange have parents have friends, have connections, and we need to leverage those youth. And it has to, we're gonna have guidance. I'm gonna have a whole operating manual uh, completed this month, but it has to be done at the club level. So having kids in for a dog and pony show, and then uh, uh, you never see them again, or an interact club or a rotaract club, uh, that's, not, that's no longer uh, good enough. So you have to think about uh, how you can exploit youth Sport is not a good, how, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely not a good use. You have to think about how to taking advantage of all of our connections with youth uh, to membership. So it's a general idea, but I think everybody can get the message. Thank you. Earl? Yeah, one of the problems with membership leads uh, in RI, it was, it was very cumbersome and difficult to manage 
And what we just recently discovered was that there is a, an additional module within DACDB where you can import those uh, membership leads into DACDB and then there's a, there's a whole system set up to help manage those things. So we're, we're still trying to figure out exactly how to use that, but uh, that's, that's our next big effort right there. Thank you, Earl. And what we're gonna, Earl's gonna do is make sure we have a, a manual sort of in place so you know, we don't forget this uh, after Earl and I are no longer on the committee. We wanna make sure people understand how to, <laughs> to, uh, to do this. So we don't wanna lose these people. Um, Okay, let's move. Thank you all for the great conversation. I think it's we have a lot more conversation on this topic to go, and I'd love to hear your input um, moving forward. But I want to spend a few minutes to talk about Australia, and we're going to start. Um, we've got just a few minutes, but I want to start with um, David Fishman. Um, I'd love to hear just a few minutes about his experience, he and his wife's experience in Australia a couple months ago, and then we'll turn it over to Bill, Bill, Bill Croxton for a few minutes as well. David. I, okay, I should be heard now, right? Yeah. Good, okay. Yeah, my wife and I had the pleasure of spending nearly a month in Australia, returning on March 25th. And uh, we were there with an organization called Friendship Force, which has very similar principles and views that Rotary International does. And in fact, Shanaz Ahmad, uh, who is a Rotarian in Alexandria, recently joined the uh, National Capital Area uh, chapter that my wife Mary is president of. But in, Aus in Australia, we were staying with um, Australian Friendship Force members most of the time, some of whom were Rotarians, in fact. And we were in first the um, on our own in uh, Brisbane, which is up in Queensland, which uh, also prides itself on being the uh, the old Australia, uh, a little like the American South. Um, we had a great time there, and then three days at Hamilton Island, uh, where the reefs are, and then came down to uh, uh, Sunshine Coast, which is a uh, a Brisbane suburb where we did a lot of um, uh, very interesting things with our colleagues. I mentioned earlier, we visited the uh, Coast Guard uh, Volunteer uh, Safety Patrol. Australia has an amazing capacity for, uh, for these kinds of volunteer efforts to protect uh, yachts people 24-7, uh, 365. And uh, then as we uh, began to transition to Sydney, the, um, the existence of the COVID-19 problem became clear to everybody. The day after we walked across the Sydney Harbor Bridge, the exchange was canceled uh, in Sydney and we went to uh, an, a, um, an apartment hotel for uh, four days before we uh, basically quarantining, self-quarantining like we're doing here now. And uh, then caught our flight back, one of the last uh, uh, Qantas flights back uh, on March 25. Uh, I was particularly interested and I'm looking forward to hearing the, uh, the uh, presentations of our uh, Australian uh, uh, police people from Perth. That's the opposite end of the country, of course, from where we were. But um, uh, the story of how Australia has been dealing with its COVID-19 uh, uh, situation is, is something that probably warrants a significant amount of discussion between Australian and uh, American Rotarians. Uh, there have been a few things in the news recently, uh, and we experienced them uh, from day one uh, while we were in our uh, quarantine hotel, we constantly saw the address of the, uh, of the Prime Minister and the conversation among different uh, Australian constituencies about how to deal with the, uh, to deal with the, with the crisis. Um, even more recently, there's been uh, an app that uh, it was discussed that local, that Australians were going to be utilizing for contract tracing but that's recently disappeared from the news, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear why. We might all uh, learn something about what they're doing in that, uh, in that area. Um, the uh, speakers today, we're going to be speaking about the uh, Australian fire situation, which of course was very, very serious this year, particularly in the Sydney suburbs. 
And maybe we brought good luck because the week we landed in Brisbane, uh, the Sydney fires were already pretty much out, but the Melbourne area where they weren't out got some torrential downpours, which really uh, drenched the fires for this, for this fire season. And among the experiences we had while we were there, we were in communication with uh, some First Nation people. Uh, my wife is an anthropologist, so you might imagine I got uh, uh, direct exposure. One of the very interesting things they're doing there is traditional uh, uh, First Peoples handling of the fire situation. They have a tradition and a culture of controlled burning and uh, uh, care for the land, which the Australian fire suppression people are beginning to take very, very seriously as part of the part of the kits and the toolbox, uh, tools and the tools in the in the kit box to 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 solve these problems. So I'm hoping that we can begin some serious conversations with our Australian Rotarian colleagues um, about these kinds of issues for the benefit of all concerned. Thank you, uh, David. And I'd be happy to answer any. I'm happy to answer any questions or or respond to comments uh, you know, as our time allows. I'm going to turn things over to Bill, and then we can uh, have a little Q and A at the end. So, Bill, would you love to talk about your experience both there and your experience hosting? Uh seven weeks plus. And um, I stayed with two doctors, one forester, one farmer, uh, one engineer, uh, a retired couple, and, uh, and a guy that's ex-military tour guide. Um, so it was a wide variety of people. Uh, they sent me to, to some doctors because I have a medical background in medical sales and development. And um, it was interesting to walk into an ICU with uh, one of my hosts and uh, one of the uh, ventilators I helped pioneer uh, was there and I got some big hugs from the nurses because they loved it. But uh, here was something from the U.S. Uh, being utilized in Australia. So that was kind of heartwarming for me. Um, we, uh, they really spent a lot of time taking us into all facets of uh, Australian life. And as I mentioned earlier, Western Australia is different from Sydney and Brisbane and, and all the other more rural, uh, more forest and uh, that type of thing. But, uh, and they even uh, were so kind to take me down to Albany where uh, there's a big oyster production. And since that was our part of my family background, that was a, a nice part of the trip too. Uh, one thing that came to mind when I was sitting here thinking about what else to talk about when we host them, one thing that might be of interest is to have some type of visit with some of our Native uh, uh, Americans. Uh, they, of course, have their in indigenous aboriginals. And uh, I spent uh, a, a number of uh, hours and a couple of days off and on uh, in, in the presence of some of these people. and. Uh, the, their story and some of the hardships that they've been through being the native people and then all of a sudden being a minority uh, that's uh, underprivileged in many cases now um, is not unlike our Native Americans. And they might find it very interesting to, uh, if we could arrange any type of thing that might give them some exposure to uh, uh, our American Indian. Um, the, uh, only other thing I can say is, uh, th they were just great friendly people and, um, I enjoyed every minute, uh, that I was there. Um, as far as hosting, um, uh, uh, you know, we had a ball with them last time, uh, and Jonesy is a live wire and, uh, I'm sure he will, uh, engineer, uh, some other fun people to come along with him. And, um. I, what I saw with what we had planned uh, on the first go round, uh, unfortunately, we didn't do it. But uh, uh, all of the things that you all had planned seemed like very good, uh, uh, informative, uh, and uh, interesting places. 
that they were going to be going. So I don't see changing anything. Uh, hopefully we can do, still do some of the same things. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And, and that's, that's the plan. Uh, you know, I think their schedule and itinerary hopefully would be very similar to what we had planned out for this year. And the goal was for them to, uh, in addition to that, also plan uh, for, the, for what would be Pat's year, a um, foundation, you know, full exchange program where we would send a team uh, from the U.S. there, and then they would send a second team of professionals, maybe not the police department this time, but another team of professionals back to the U.S. Um, in two years from now. So, um, you know, exciting stuff to formalize that relationship, keep it going, and broaden that exchange of uh, ideas and just in friendship. Great idea. It's a 12th, Mary, please. Oh, very quickly. Uh, six years ago, we spent six weeks in Australia. And as Bill said, we just we had such a wonderful time. They're wonderful folks, very friendly. Um, and we ended it with the um, International Convention there in Sydney that year. Um, we just, well, I'm really looking forward to, to Jonesy and the others coming. And the fact that we're going to do a, a more formalized exchange from now on, or at least for a while, that's wonderful. Amen. Um, yeah, we look forward to that. I think it's going to be a great program. Uh, and look forward to, you know, that's one of the sort of the, the markers we're getting back to normal. It, hopefully they'll be able to travel and be here and, and we can host people in person. And, and so it's sort of a little bit of light in the tunnel to think about that. And we, we hope that things progress in a way where that's definitely possible. And um, I just want to say thank you for everybody joining again today for our meeting. Sorry for the change in subject matter, but I think we had a couple good conversations. Um, so thank you for your flexibility. Most of all, thank you for keeping Rotary alive in 7610 during this time and just uh, being amazing Rotarians and amazing people.